So today we're going to talk about poison and negative binomial regression. And these are regression models that you use when certain violations are occurring with data and you can't use ordinary least squares. And basically those assumptions are, one is the outcome variable is a, is a type of count and it's discrete and it's not continuous. And uh, OLS usually assumes that the variable of choice is is a continuous measure and that there's values between 1 and 2, like a 1.5. But if you're counting maybe the number of children, you don't really have 1.5 children, so that violation is occurring. Also, another thing that might be happening is the residuals might not have a bell-shaped distribution, which would also violate uh, OLS. In these situations, um, you usually just make an adjustment by using a different type of distribution, assuming a different type of distribution in the the probability function. Um, one is a poison distribution uh, and another one is a negative binomial distribution. Basically you use the poison regression first uh, holding that maybe there's some assumptions that are being held and if those assumptions are also not being held then you can move on to use a negative binomial regression. To summarize you use these models basically when you have counts so I've written here like for instance the total number of children a woman had or maybe the number of times somebody was injured during a year, uh, the number of times a person had sex a week. All these are counts, and they're also low counts. They're not going to be very high. So, for instance, for women, it might be 0, 1, 2, or 3. Um, you know, number of times getting injured similarly wouldn't be very high. Uh, sociologists sometimes will kind of ignore the issue of counts if the number is really high, if we're talking about something that's in the thousands. Uh, in those situations, you can kind of assume a normal distribution. Um, but when you have low counts, the distribution really is very different, and you can't really just use OLS. So let's start with um, uh, poison, and then uh, we'll talk about when you should not use poison and maybe move on to a binomial regression. Okay, so let's get started, and we're going to be using the same data set we used last time, the public health data set that looks at labor history in terms of prenatal care and uh, premature labor and uh, birth weight count and so forth. If we load it up from the web, let's go ahead and look at how many times women had um, premature labor. And you'll see that this is a count uh, and that it's really not a continuous variable at all. And uh, you see here the hi histogram, a lot, most women, you know, have never had premature labor. Uh, a couple of them have had one and uh, very few of them have had two. And you just look at this distribution, you know, it's a count. This is a discrete variable. There's nothing in between. It's not normally distributed in the conventional sense. But poison regression might be a useful way of uh, modeling this. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, do a poison regression. You just type in poison. Uh, I might be pronouncing that wrong. My French is not that great. Uh, and then uh, put in the dependent variable and then an independent variable. So let's look at whether or not age is a good uh, predictor. Uh, we see here this model has kind of a very low R squared uh, and age is not significantly associated with premature labor. So let's go ahead and add another predictor. Make, maybe our model will improve if we include this smoke variable. And um, poison regression, all the results are actually in log linear form, and so they're a little bit difficult to un interpret. And so if you put in this comma and put IRR, it's actually going to exponentiate uh, the coefficient. So it's a little bit easier to interpret. So I, I always like to have um, that option uh, selected when I do these types of regressions. Uh, similarly, when we do logistic regression. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight that and run it. And uh, we see that our model is a little bit better um, in that smoking is uh, significantly associated with premature labor. And it gives me exponentiated coefficient of 2.6. So smoking increases your odds of having a higher count of premature labor by 2.6 times. So that's pretty significant. And our pseudo R square goes slightly up. Uh, next, I'm going to go ahead and add race, and uh, race is a categorical variable. I think we have three groups, and just like logistic regression or any regression, if I type in this xi preface command and put a colon uh, before the actual command, uh, it's going to create a dummy variable for any variable that I identify with an i in a, in a period. So poison, uh, this is my dependent variable, predictors are age, smoke, then I identify race as being that categorical variable that I want turn into a, a dummy variable. 
And basically this is a nice way of kind of creating dummy variables on the fly. It's going to go highlight that and run it. We see that race is not uh, important, uh, and smoking still is. Uh, it dropped down a little bit, um, but race is not important, neither is age. So, And I didn't do the exponentiated form, so I can go ahead and run that. So we see that smoking is actually increased once you control for race. So, you know, that's an example of poison, but there is one assumption to this type of modeling, and the assumption is, is that the mean uh, of the counts is equal to the variance of the count, which sometimes occurs, but sometimes doesn't occur. So after you run a poison regression, or maybe even before running a poison regression, uh, if you know you have a count, you might just want to do a basic summary of the statistics of the sample to see how, to what degree can we assume that the mean and the variance are the same. So, um, you know, I was happy with my model, but I just want to make sure that if that assumption holds, I'm just going to do sum. And we see that the mean is uh, around 0.19. Uh, the standard deviation, we should take the square of that um, because that will give us the variance. And that will be around a 0.25, I, roughly, uh, my, in my head. And that is, you know, that's close to the mean, but not exactly equal to the mean. So it might be worthwhile to write, go ahead and run a binomial negative regression uh, since the mean and standard deviation are slightly different. And to do that, you can just type in negative binomial regression, or you can just type in NB reg, the dependent variable, and the predictor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just run this one with that includes the smoking variable. So um, when you get the binomial regression uh, display, the first thing you look at is perhaps this last line right here, which does a ratio test of alpha. And alpha is this assumption that the mean and the variance are the same. And it does this kind of chi-square test. And basically, you can reject that idea that alpha is zero, uh, meaning that the mean and the variance are the same, so they're, they're not. So this kind of justifies um, the use of a negative binomial regression instead of poison. So to say that a little bit more clearly, uh, because this is below 0.1 or point, close to 0.05, um, we can reject the idea that the variance and the mean are the same, and therefore we can accept the idea of using a negative binomial regression. If we look here at the actual display, smoking is still associated with the premature uh, labor history in terms of counts. Let's go ahead and add those other predictors now that we know we, we can use the binomial regression. Uh, let's go ahead and use the race um, using the same XI command. And I'm going to go ahead and exponentiate coefficient so that we can kind of interpret it. And we see that race is also not significant here and the exponentiated smoking is very similar to actually what the poison had given us but the negative binomial f form would be the most appropriate thing to do uh, one last thing that you might that you might want to do since you were doing a negative binomial regression is is to think about how the issue of dispersion between the variance and the mean are being uh, calculated and alpha here is that measure right the, between mean and variance um, but there's actually different ways that you can calculate this notion of dispersion between mean and variance. Um, and I won't go much into detail, but basically another way of calculating the dispersion is by assuming it's a constant form. Um, and that will give you slightly different result uh, for that dispersion uh, measure. And uh, you can just change that by putting an option. And this would just be whether or not there could be a better model for modeling the dispersion between variance and mean. So I'm going to run the exact same model except changing the way that the dispersion is calculated. And you'll notice I'll get similar results. But you'll notice here that delta is being used instead of alpha, which is just a different measure of um, dispersion. It gives us a very similar uh, effect for smoking. You know, it's 3.2 instead of 3.19. The question is, which model should you use? Which is a better model, actually? Uh, and you can look at now at the log likelihood um, of of the model that the computer finally came up with, and the rule is is the one that is closest to zero in its absolute form is technically the better model. And just looking at um, this model and the previous model, you see here negative ninety five point seven is the first model, and negative five point one seven is the second model. So in absolute form, the second model is better. So negative binomial regression is the appropriate choice here. 
but uh, modeling the dispersion um, as a constant it would be the better way of of handling this particular regression. Um, before we go, we just want to put one caveat to this discussion. We're not uh, we didn't talk about issues of zeros um, with when we're dealing with uh, poison or negative binomial uh, issues because uh, that's a really complicated issue because let's say we had a variable that didn't have any zeros. Uh, that really kind of complicates uh, some of the poison's assumptions. And similarly, there's an issue that occurs that when you have too many zeros, um, where there's an inflation of the zeros. And those issues uh, we can't really cover in depth in a video like this. Uh, but are these all, those are issues that you do have to worry about if you don't have zeros in your particular distribution of counts or if you have too many. Um, so um, perhaps one day we'll make a video kind of talking about those issues and how to solve them. But that might be something you might need to look up uh, yourselves and uh, explore. Um, in terms of these videos, the next video we're going to be doing is quantile regression. And in those situations, we're going to be looking at the median instead of the mean. Um, and that might be a useful thing, uh, particularly because mean is usually very influenced by outliers. Um, it's a very sensitive measure of the, the central tendency of a distribution. And sometimes it's easier or makes sense to look at the median. So something like IQ scores or income. Uh, you can actually do a regression on the median instead of the mean. Uh, and so we'll cover that next time.